we covered maybe about the first half an hour of this lecture last week, but let me do a super quick review of what we covered just to make sure we're, we're back on the same page. Um, a, a tissue is a group of cells functioning together. I should say a group of cells of the same type functioning together. Um, so this is supposed to be a cell, and a tissue is just a group of cells of, of that same type all physically together, all, all functioning together as, as a group. Oop. Come back here, you silly thing. There we go. Um, and, and tissues are, are yeah, they're, it's a group of cells of the same type. So what I'm saying is if we're talking about a muscle tissue, it means it's made out of muscle cells. And if we're talking about an epithelial tissue, it's a tissue that's made out of epithelial cells. The tissue is always named for the type of cell that it's made out of. OK, uh, and one of the reasons we're studying tissues is because they are the building blocks of organs. This is supposed to be the stomach organ. And just by definition, all organs are made out of several tissues working together. You can see that uh, if we think of this as epithelial tissue, we can see that the organ, the muscle organ, does have a layer of epithelial tissue, but it also has other types of tissues. Um, that's the way organs are. They're made out of um, several tissues uh, working together. And organs are the building blocks of organ systems. There we go. Like the digestive organ system is made out of several different organs functioning together, all to digest your food. And you are made out of all your organ systems, like your digestive system and your skeletal system and your muscular system. Well, remember that how this class is organized is around the organ systems of the body. Um, we haven't actually started any organ systems yet, um, but we, we will this week. Uh, but to understand those organ systems, you'll have to understand the organs that make up those organ systems. And to understand how's the, how those organs function, you're going to need to understand the tissues, which is why we're doing this, this lecture on the tissues of the body. All right, well, you might remember from last week's lecture, there are actually just four major tissue types in the human body. They're called epithelial tissue, muscle tissue, nervous tissue, and connective tissue. I made a chart there on that uh, back wall. Um, that I encourage you to, to copy down in your notes. And as I go through this lecture, I'm going to add uh, things to that chart. Um, what we're going to do is go through these tissues one at a time and talk about its structure, You know what sort of cells make up that tissue, uh, what the function of that tissue is in the body, and, and the different subcategories of it. Because these are the four major tissue types in the human body. but they have subcategories to them. For instance, there are three subcategories of muscle tissue, and there are six subcategories of connective tissue. And, and some of those subcategories have sub subcategories to them. So it, it can get a little complicated, but don't let that distract you from the essential simplicity that there are just four major tissue types in the human body. OK, uh, so we started last week, we started talking about epithelial tissue. If I had to summarize it in two words, I would say protective linings. It's a tissue that forms uh, protective linings in the body. Uh, here we go. Uh, sheets of tightly packed cells that form protective linings. For right now, don't worry about the other part there about absorb and secreting. Just focus on uh, protective linings. Here we go. Um, so in golden colored here, this is an example of an epithelial tissue made out of epithelial cells. And epithelial tissues sit on top of other tissues. The pink tissue is not epithelial tissue. Uh, that pink tissue is some other tissue that the epithelial tissue is protecting. So yeah, picture epithelial tissues as tight, tissues made of tightly packed epithelial cells. And they always sit on top of some other tissue to be a protective lining to protect that other tissue. Um, here we go. Uh, most textbooks, if you biology textbooks, if you look up epithelial tissue, the first example they give is the skin. And that's true, or at least the outer layer of the skin is epithelial tissue. And that is a protective lining. It's protecting your body from dangerous things in the environment, like bacteria or toxins. Um, your skin is also protecting you from loss of your body fluids. 
it definitely qualifies it as a protective lining. Um, but that being said, most of the epithelial tissues that we're going to talk about this semester are found inside your hollow organs. A lot of your organs are hollow, like your stomach, your blood vessels, just to name a couple. And those organs are hollow because something is flowing through them, like your food through your stomach and blood through your blood vessels. Well, to protect, to protect the various tissues of those hollow organs from the substance that's flowing through that hollow organ, for all of your hollow organs, it's always epithelial tissue that is the innermost lining of all tubes, hollow organs, all cavities in your body. It's always, always, always going to be epithelial tissue that's the innermost lining. Uh, just to give an example, if you look at the, these blood vessels right there, the cells that they colored in gold and that are the inner lining of the blood vessel, that's epithelial tissue. And it's protecting the other tissues of the blood vessel from the blood. Uh, here's another example. This is supposed to be the stomach. Um, the stomach is full of acids and digestive enzymes. So the innermost lining of the stomach is epithelial tissue, the golden colored tissue there, to protect the other tissue layers of the stomach from, from the acids and things inside the stomach. Good. So all your hollow organs, the innermost lining is always going to be epithelial tissue. Uh, now, with some of those epithelial tissues, they also have not just protect their job of protection, but also absorb and secrete substances. Uh, the stomach is a good example of that. It's inner lining, it's epithelial tissue, not only protects the other tissues, but the epithelial lining of your stomach secretes acids and digestive enzymes, and then the epithelial tissue also absorbs the water and nutrients from the foods that are being digested. Um, other epithelial tissues in your hollow organs don't sub absorb or secrete anything. Some epithelial tissues are just protective, and they, that's all that they do. But others also sub absorb and secrete. All right, um, well, let's see. Uh, there we go. Uh, there are some subcategories to the epithelial tissues. One way in which epithelial tissues are subcategorized is what, how many layers of epithelial cells there are in the epithelial tissue. If it's just one single layer of epithelial cells, you call, cells you call it a simple epithelial tissue. If there's more than one layer, you call it a stratified epithelial tissue. And there's a, a third layer type called pseudostratified, which has the look of being more than one layer, but it's actually just, just a single layer, pseudostratified. And there's also some shape terms in terms of um, classifying an epithelial tissue. If the epithelial cells are kind of flattened, you say it is squamous epithelial tissue, the cell shape is. If the cell sh or sh cells are shaped more or less like cubes, it's cuboidal epithelial tissue. And if the cells are taller than they are wider, it's columnar epithelial tissue. Um, good. And as you can kind of see, if your eyes are good at seeing in the dark well, uh, in the chart on the board there, I'm listing the subcategories of the various tissues. And you can see for epithelial, it, lay, it lists those three layer types and those three shape types. Uh, and then w we did a drill last week where I showed you some tissues, and I said, what type of epithelial tissue is this? For instance, this was simple squamous epithelial tissue. And this was simple columnar epithelial tissue. And simple cuboidal stratified squamous epithelial tissue. Um, maybe I should give you, you a chance. Uh, so who can tell me what type of epithelial tissue is this? It's is pseudostratified, yeah. It's, uh, it's definitely columnar, and the cells are a lot taller than they are wide. And it's pseudostratified, because each one that goes to the top touches the bottom, so it's one cell layer thick. But some of them look like they're in more than one layer, right? This area looks like it's more than one layer, so pseudo pseudostratified means fake stratified. Oh, while I'm showing this picture here, some epithelial tissues have these little hair-like extensions called cilia. And if the epithelial cells have cilia, you have to add the word ciliated in front of all the other words. So uh, the proper classification of this one would be ciliated 
pseudostratified columnar epithelial tissue. There's a mouthful, right? Ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelial tissue. Um, who can take a guess? What's this one? This epithelial tissue. It's simple cuboidal, very good. It's one la cell layer thick. There's the basement membrane, the bottom right there. Here's the top right there, one cell layer thick. But this, the cells look about as tall as they are wide, so that's cuboidal. Um, this one you see here, it's definitely columnar, and it's a little unclear. It's either simple columnar or pseudostratified columnar. And at least if some of these look like they have cilia, so it's probably ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelial tissue. And this is uh, stratified epithelial tissue, uh, stratified squamous epithelial tissue. Good. Uh, so epithelial tissues, protective linings. Um, muscle tissues, I think we just started in on those last time. If I had to describe muscle tissue in just one single word, I would say movement. It's a tissue that causes uh, movement, movement of body parts and movement of substances within your body. Uh, so let me begin with the movement of body parts as, as an example. Um, one muscle that, just as an example, that moves body parts is your bicep muscle. It's this one right here. And it moves your forearm. It flexes your forearm up like that. Um, muscles cause movement by contracting, which means making themselves smaller. Uh, and just to give an example, uh, I guess I did this last week. If I attach myself to this big desk and this little desk right here, and then I contract myself, I end up generating pulling force. Right? If I contract myself, I end up pulling on the two desks. And that's going to cause some movement, right? This desk right here is going to scoot closer to that desk. And so that's the way your muscles cause movement. They contract. When they contract, they end up pulling on your body parts. And that's what causes the body part to move. Uh, here you see the bicep muscle there. It's attached to these two bones right here, just like I was attached to the two desks. And then when I click the button, it's going to contract. It'll end up pulling on those bones, and that's what causes the forearm to flex up like that. Awesome. Uh, now, here I've been emphasizing muscles as moving body parts, like the forearm. Uh, other muscles move fluids inside the body. Um, we'll talk about some examples of those here in a little while. But just to give an example, your heart is, is a muscular organ. And it, it causes your blood to circulate. It causes the blood to move inside the body. OK, uh, so muscle tissue is tissue that causes movement uh, of body parts or fluids inside the body. And it causes that movement by contracting, by getting smaller. And that's kind of an amazing thing. Um, muscle tissue is the only tissue that can contract itself to a smaller size. How does it do that? Well, because the muscle cells contract. Um, you know, muscle tissue is made out of muscle cells, which we can think of these, these um, kind of cigar-shaped cells right there. Well, the muscle tissue contracts because each muscle cell contracts. So to understand the contraction of the muscle tissue, we have to under understand the contraction of the individual muscle cells. And that's what that next section of text is all about. How do the individual muscle cells contract? Or it should go on a slight tangent here. Um, in many textbooks, they call muscle cells muscle fibers. And I always found that a little bit confusing because it's a cell. And so why would we want to call it something else? Uh, so, so I usually just say muscle cell. But if you're reading the textbook and it talks about muscle fibers, it, it just means muscle cells. OK, so this uh, red outlined thing here is supposed to be one muscle cell. Inside each muscle cell, the cell is packed with some proteins, um, two major types of proteins. The, the protein that I'm showing in blue there is a type of protein called myosin. Uh, oh, gracious, I uh, 
see that I misspelled it here. I wrote miso in sin. Uh, that's a misspelling. I think I've got it spelled correctly here. There it is, myosin. So somebody remind me to fix that uh, at some point. Uh, anyway, that's myosin is the one I'm showing in blue there. And the ones I'm showing in yellow there are the actin. Uh, so the myosin and actin are the two main types of proteins you find inside muscle cells. Uh, both of those proteins um, are kind of long and thin shaped, right? Well, anything that, like a thread, anything that has that particular shape, like a thread-like shape, uh, is said to be a filament. So uh, the proteins inside muscle cells are sometimes called protein filaments, or just the filaments. Um, notice also that the myosins are a little bit thicker than the actins. If you think of the actins as thread-like, the myosins are maybe like pieces of yarn. They're just, they're, they're just a little bit thicker than the actins are. Uh, so the myosins are sometimes called the thick protein filaments, and the actins are sometimes called the, the thin protein filaments. But I usually just call them the, the myosin and the actin. All right, well, notice that both of those protein types are found in stacks, like here's a stack of myosins and here's a stack of actins. Well, to the left and the right of the stack of myosins are the stacks of actins. And that's, that's the way it is inside muscle cells. You find the myosins and the actins in stacks. For each uh, stack of myosin, there's always a stack of actin to its left and to its right. OK, uh, so this muscle cell is relaxed, meaning it's not contracting right now. Notice that when the muscle cell is relaxed, there is very little overlap between the filaments. And what I'm saying is that when it's relaxed, there's very little overlap between the actins and the myosins. When a muscle cell is going to contract, that changes. When the muscle cell contracts, the actin stacks slide inward over the myosin stack, and that is a more compact arrangement of the protein filaments, and that makes the cell smaller. You'll see it here when I click the button. There we go. Yeah, so muscle cell contraction is all about the actin sliding inward over the myosins, and there's more overlap now. In other words, it's a more compact arrangement of the protein filaments, and that's how the cell contracts. Notice that none of those proteins got any shorter. Like the myosins are just as long as they were, and the actins are just as long as they were. In fact, let me run it backwards. There we go. So notice that none of the protein filaments change their length. They just increase the amount of overlap that they had. Good. Anyway, so the actin sliding inward over the myosins is the secret of how a muscle cell contracts. Uh, muscle cells shorten by sliding the active filaments over the myosin filaments, increasing the amount of overlap. All right, um, so moving on. Oh, <laughs> I remember what I was going to mention here, that um, muscle tissue, go back, uh, muscle tissue is very high in protein because the muscle tissue is made out of muscle cells, and muscle cells are just jam-packed with those proteins, with the myosins and actin, actin proteins. Uh, and so that relates to the fact that meat is a high-protein food. Meat is animal muscle. That's just a big muscle from, I guess, a cow or something. Uh, and it's, uh, it, yeah, it, it's high-protein because it's full of actin and myosin uh, proteins. So if you're the one in your household cooking dinner tonight and it's going to be meat, and people say, what's on the menu tonight? You can say, oh, we're going to eat a bunch of myosin and actin protein filaments. And they're, they're going to think you're so cool if you say that. All right, um, well, muscle tissue, there's three subcategories of muscle tissue. They're called skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle, smooth muscle, and cardiac muscle. It's 
skeletal muscle, smooth muscle, and cardiac muscle. Uh, each of those three muscle types has its own function in the body and, and, and its own particular type of muscle cell. Uh, so what we're going to do now is go through those uh, three types of muscle tissue. I made a uh, table here, and you can see in your lecture outlines, uh, for each of the three muscle types, skeletal muscle, smooth muscle, and cardiac muscle, I talk about its location, its function, and, and some other characteristics of that, uh, of that muscle tissue. Okay, so beginning with skeletal muscle tissue, um, its, its location is it's attached to your bones. Um, you can see in the picture there, those two skeletal muscles right here and right here, you can see that they're attached to some bones around the shoulder and the arm. Um, that's why they call skeletal muscle skeletal muscle because it's attached to your bones. Um, you can see that each of those skeletal muscles is attached to the bone by this little gray looking structure there. Those are called tendons. So each skeletal muscle has tendons at its ends and it's the tendons of the skeletal muscle that actually attach to the bones. All right, and the function of skeletal muscle is to move your body parts. I guess I demonstrated that movement right there. Uh, so all movement of your body parts, your arms, your fingers, your head and neck, your legs, your thighs, your toes, your abdomen, any movement of your body part is caused by your skeletal muscles pulling on your skeleton. I think I have a cartoon of that. Uh, to move your forearm, you contract your bicep muscle, and it, by do, doing so, it pulls on the bones of the forearm, and that flexes it up like that. And if you want to extend your arm so it's straight again, your tricep muscle contracts, and when it does, it pulls on the back of some of those bones, and that straightens out your arm. So forearm and all your body parts, they are moved by your skeletal muscles pulling on, pulling on the bones of your body. Um, now, you probably already know some of the names of the major skeletal muscles of the body, like uh, you might know that these are your pectoralis majors and this is your bicep muscle and your tricep muscle, and you might know that these are your quadriceps down there in the front of your thigh, and you might know that the back of your thigh is your um, uh, hamstring muscles, and these are your abdominal muscles. Um, and if you don't know those muscle terms, don't worry about it for today's lecture. We're going to do a whole chapter on the muscular system in a few weeks, and you'll learn those names then. I'm just saying that, that if you know the names of any muscle already, those are skeletal muscles that, that you know the names of there. All of them are for more moving your body parts. Now, um, skeletal muscle tissue is what we call voluntary. And in this context, that means that you get to consciously decide when it contracts and relaxes. You know, think about that. You get to consciously decide when you want to flex your forearm up. That means you consciously decide when your uh, skeletal muscle that skeletal muscle contracts or relaxes. Uh, and, and so that is one of the characteristics of skeletal muscle. It's voluntary. It's the only three of the muscle types that's voluntary. The other two, smooth muscle and heart uh, muscle, cardiac muscle, are involuntary. You do not get to consciously control when they contract or relax. Your, the subconscious parts of your body contract and relax them for you. So just as a, as a tip for future quizzes and midterms, if I ask you a question like, which of the three muscle types causes this movement of your wrist, all you have to do is say, well, I can voluntarily control that, right? And so it's got to be skeletal muscle. All right, uh, good. So skeletal muscle is voluntary muscle. Let's uh, focus our attention, attention on the cells of skeletal muscle. So in other words, these are skeletal muscle cells. Here it is. Their shape is described as long cigar shaped, like you can kind of see there. Uh, long cigar shape. 
um, they have multiple nuclei. So remember, the nucleus of a cell is kind of this region in the center of the cell where the DNA is. Cells almost always just have one nucleus, but skeletal muscle cells are the exception to that rule. Skeletal muscle cells have multiple nuclei. You can see them as the little blue dots right there. And uh, something else interesting about skeletal muscle cells is they have what are called striations, which means stripes. So notice this part of the skeletal muscle cell is relatively kind of a light pink, but this area has some dark pink, light pink, dark pink. So we say that these are light and dark striations all along the length of the skeletal muscle cell. OK, you take a guess. What causes those striations? What inside the skeletal muscle cell would you guess causes those striations? Well, we just talked about it like two minutes ago. What's inside muscle cells? Act in mice, thank you. And if you had to take a guess, which of those two proteins do you think causes the darker striation? Myosin, why? It's thicker, thank you, that's exactly it. Very good to, bo to both of you. Yeah, so um, striations just mean stripes, and all skeletal muscles have these alternating light and dark stripes, like you see there, striations, I should say. The dark striations are the myos stacks of myosin, the light striations are the stacks of actin, and that should make some sense because the myosins are thicker, and so they just cast a deeper shadow. That's why they make a dark striation. And the actins are very thin, so they don't cast much of a shadow at all, and so that's why they cause, that's why they appear as the lighter striations in the skeletal muscle cell. Good. So when you see the light, alternating light, dark, light, dark, light, dark, light, dark striations, skeletal muscle cell, that's stack of actin, stack of myosin, stack of actin, stack of myosin, stack of actin, stack of myosin, all along the length of the, uh, of the skeletal muscle cell. All right, good, 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 good. So skeletal muscle cells, or skeletal muscle tissue, I should say, it's uh, for movement of your body parts, voluntary movement of your body parts. Oh, actually, I'm not quite done. Um, so that's just one skeletal muscle cell. But skeletal muscle tissue, of course, is made out of many skeletal muscle cells together. Uh, so that's what I tried to symbolize here. If you look at skeletal muscle tissue under the microscope, you'd see lots of skeletal muscle cells. Um, the next slide, th this, of course, is just a homemade cartoon. Uh, the next slide is a photograph through a microscope of skeletal muscle tissue. and see it like there is one skeletal muscle cell. Ooh. One second. There we go. So there is one skeletal muscle cell. You can see the alternating dark and light striations all along its length. And you can see the multiple nuclei, like there's a nucleus, and there's a nucleus, and there's some nuclei there. Here's another skeletal muscle cell right there with its own striations and nuclei. Here's another skeletal muscle cell with its striations and its nuclei. This looks like about, uh, I don't know, a stack of about, or a cluster of about, I don't know, 10 or so um, skeletal muscle cells. Um, anyway, you have some skeletal muscle tissue is made out of a bunch of skeletal muscle cells. We're going to do a, a laboratory in a few weeks, uh, in about three weeks, on uh, the muscles. And during that laboratory, I'll set up a microscope, and you'll be able to look under the microscope and see something that looks like this uh, for the skeletal muscle tissue. OK, the uh, next of the three muscle tissue types is called smooth muscle tissue. It's found in the walls of your hollow organs. Um, maybe I should kind of stop there. So uh, many of your organs are hollow organs. Not all of your organs are hollow, but many are, are hollow. Like your blood vessels are a hollow organ, your stomach, and in intestines and other digestive organs are hollow organs. Your bladder is a hollow organ. If you're a female, your uterus is a hollow organ. Um, all of those organs are hollow because something flows through them. You know, blood goes through the blood vessels. Food goes through your intestines and your stomach. Uh, urine goes through your bladder. If you're a female, the, the, the baby uh, goes through the uterus. Um, anyway, so in all of those hollow organs, there's something that's flowing through that organ, going through that organ. 
the reason why you have the smooth muscle in the walls of those hollow organs is to move the substance through the hollow organ. Um, I call this the toothpaste tube principle. So here's the tube of my toothpaste. And it's like a hollow organ, right? There's a hollow space inside there. And what fills the substance inside, of course, is the toothpaste. Well, think about it. If I squeeze on it, that makes the toothpaste move, right? If I squeeze on it, you can see that the, the toothpaste gets pushed through the tube, out of the tube. And so that's the way to think of, that's the way to think of, I need a garbage can now. Uh, that's the way to think of uh, smooth muscle. It's, it, you find it in the walls of hollow organs so that it can propel the substance through the organ. Just by, by squeezing inward, it makes the substance move. So just to give an example, uh, think of your digestive organs, like your stomach and your intestines. The food goes inside there, but eventually the, the food has to move through those organs, like, like when the digestion is done. Uh, so that's where the smooth muscle in those organs comes into play. It squeezes, and just like with the toothpaste tube here, that pushes the food through the organs, uh, out of those digestive organs. Or to give, give another example, your bladder, um, when it comes time to go to the bathroom, that urine has to be pressurized so it flows out of the bladder and out of your body. Well, that's where the smooth muscle in the wall of the bladder comes into play. It squeezes inward to pressurize the urine to get it to flow out. Uh, here's the uterus. If you're an anatomical female, when it comes time to give birth, the smooth muscle in the uterus squeezes inward on the baby to get the baby to, to, to come out of the uterus, to, to, to flow out of the uterus and be born. All right, so smooth muscle found in the wall. Uh, walls of hollow, or, hollow organs, and its, its function is to squeeze on the substance inside the hollow organ for the purpose of getting that substance to flow through the organ. It is not voluntary, meaning that you do not consciously control when smooth muscle contracts or relaxes. Think about your stomach, for example. When there's food in there, it has to contract to, pro to propel the food out of the stomach. But you don't have to consciously do that. You don't say, hey, I've been digesting my breakfast for three hours now. It's time to move out of the stomach. You know, you're, the smooth muscle in your stomach does that for you. It's not a, you can't consciously control when it contracts or relaxes. Uh, good, so it's involuntary. Um, let's see what it looks like at a cellular level. Uh, so there is the skeletal muscle cells. We saw those before. Here's a smooth muscle cell. They're described as short with pointed ends. Um, an old word for pointed is tapered. So in some textbooks, you'll, you'll see them described as short with tapered ends. Um, you can see the nucleus there in the middle. But you don't see any striations. Um, smooth muscle cells do have actin and myosin inside, all muscles cells do. But inside smooth muscle cells, the actin and myosin is not arranged in the same orderly pattern that we saw in the skeletal muscle cells. And so you just can't see any distinctive dark striations or light striations. Um, as a matter of fact, the dark and the light striations just sort of become color-wise mixed together into sort of an even shade of pink. And that's where the term smooth muscle came from, because un under the microscope, it's not stripy. And so it's just kind of a smooth pink sh shade. And that's why they call it smooth muscle. All right, and then uh, moving onward, the last of the three muscle tissue types is called cardiac muscle tissue. Oh, actually, sorry, not quite done. Um, this is a microscope close-up of some smooth muscle tissue. Like on this one, you can see the nucleus is there. And it's a little hard to see, but that might be its pointed end right there. This one, maybe you can see a little better. So here's its nucleus. And it looks like it comes to a pointed end either there or perhaps there. It's a little hard to tell. And this one right here, you see its nucleus. And you can see one of its pointed ends uh, right there. OK, uh, so moving on to the last of our three muscle tissue types. It's called cardiac muscle tissue. Cardiac means heart because that's where you find 
cardiac muscle tissue. It's found in the heart and only in the heart, no other place in the body. It's, uh, well, the function of the heart is to pump the blood. The function of the heart is to make the blood circulate throughout the body. And that's why the heart is muscular. That's why the heart's made out of cardiac muscle tissue. Um, I guess we kind of talked about this concept already. If there's a liquid inside a hollow container and you squeeze on it, that makes the liquid squirt out, right? Um, and so that's why your heart is built out of cardiac muscle tissue, uh, the, the, to, to squirt the blood, to make the blood circulate. So think of this as representing your heart. Just like your heart, this has a hollow space inside that's filled with a liquid. Well, your heart has hollow chambers inside that are filled up with blood. Well, to get that blood to squirt out of the heart and circulate, that's where the cardiac muscle of the heart comes in. The cardiac muscle of the heart squeezes on the blood in those hollow, hollow chambers, and that makes the blood squirt out of the heart to circulate. So every time your heart beats, every time it goes lubbed up, that's the cardiac muscle contracting to squirt the blood out. Lubbed up, lubbed up, lubbed up, lubbed up. Hey, there's a cable in there. I could use that. All right. Uh, Loved up, loved up, good. So that's why you have cardiac muscle, is to allow your heart to pump the blood, which is the job of the heart. Um, cardiac muscle tissue is involuntary. You do not consciously control when it contracts and relaxes. You know, you can't decide to relax your heart and make it stop beating. Why would you do that anyway? You can't consciously control your heart to make it beat. Um, it's it's not voluntary. All right, and as for uh, the shape of the cardiac muscle cells, they're different from the other two shapes, right? The skeletal muscles were long cigar shaped. The uh, smooth muscle cells were short with pointed ends. Uh, cardiac muscle cells are branched, as you can see here. They are the only branched um, uh, type of uh, muscle cell. They have striations, and uh, remember that those are caused by the stacks of actin and myosin, so if you see a dark striation, that's a stack of myosin, and the light striations are stacks of actin. They have one more feature that's kind of noteworthy in addition to their uh, being branched and have striations, and that features things called intercalated discs. Here we go. Um, so look at the tip of the I should say the tips of the cardiac muscle cell. I showed sort of a gray disc with little holes in it, like there and there and there. So at each tip of a cardiac muscle cell, it has those little disc-shaped things with the holes in them. Those are called intercalated discs. And notice that there's not, none of those intercalated discs at the tip of the other two types, right? No intercalated discs on smooth muscle, no intercalated discs at the uh, tips of the skeletal muscle. They're only found in cardiac muscle cells. Um, so what are those intercalated discs for? Well, uh, so, you know, you find cardiac muscle cells in your heart, because your heart's made out of cardiac muscle tissue. Uh, and the cardiac muscle tissue, of course, is lots of cardiac muscle cells together, right? Any tissue is made out of lots of that cell type. So uh, even though I'm not showing it here, imagine this is cardiac muscle tissue and this particular cardiac muscle cell is right next to it, all of its neighboring cardiac muscle cells. Um, well, the intercalated discs, because they have little holes in them, allow neighboring cardiac muscle cells to connect with each other. The, the cytoplasm, the liquid that fills the cardiac muscle cells of one cardiac muscle cell, is connected to the cytoplasm of all the neighboring cardiac muscle cells thanks to those little holes in the intercalated discs. And so in other, in other words, they allow the cardiac muscle cells to interconnect with their neighbors, and that allows them to beat in unison. For your heart to pump the blood effectively, large areas, you know, millions of cardiac muscle cells have to beat in unison with each other, and they're able to synchronize their beats with each other because they're all interconnected with those intercalated discs. All right. The, uh, Next slide is a microscope slide of cardiac muscle tissue. Oh, sorry, this is a uh, artist's drawing of cardiac muscle tissue. 
uh, like you see one cardiac muscle cell here. You can see it's branched. You can see the striations, the smaller light and dark stripes. But notice at the tips, it's kind of a darker looking line. That's the intercalated disc. So there's the intercalated disc that links this cardiac muscle cell to this cardiac muscle cell. And at this end, there's the intercalated disc that links that cardiac muscle cell to its neighbor. So all of them are interconnecting with their neighbors through those uh, intercalated discs at their tips. Now this is the um, artist's rendition. Um, the photograph is a little harder to interpret, but I think you'll see it. Here it is. So like, for instance, here is one cardiac muscle cell, and you can see the striations from the actin and myosin inside of it, but at each end you see a kind of a darker line. Those are the intercalated discs at its tip that connect it to its, uh, to its neighboring cardiac muscle cells. All right, you guys now might be experts in the three types of muscle tissue. Any muscle tissue questions? Anything, anything you always wanted to know about muscles but were afraid to ask? All right, well, moving on. Our next uh, of the four major tissue types is nervous tissue. Um, so maybe I should begin before I give details about nervous tissue talk about well, where do you find it? Well, you actually find nervous tissue throughout your body. Um, so the area that they colored in here, the brain and the spinal cord, those are certainly nervous tissue, but what these areas that they're colored in in yellow right there, that's also nervous tissue. So nervous tissue, you can find it in all regions of your body. Uh, but that being said, your brain and your spinal cord are the two organs with the most nervous tissue in them. The brain and spinal cord are relatively large organs, and they're made almost 100% uh, out of nervous tissue. Uh, but, but again, you, you find the nervous tissue in, in all, all parts of your body, not just the brain and spinal cord. All right, um, so a few things about nervous tissue. Uh, you know, each tissue type is made out of its own particular cell type. For nervous tissue, the cell type is called neurons. Sometimes people say nerve cells, but the official anatomy term for the cells of nervous tissue is neurons. As far as the functions of the nervous tissue, it does two major things. It detects sense stimuli, and it transmits signals rapidly between body parts. Uh, let's do the first part of that, detect sense stimuli. So, we human beings have five major senses, sight, sound, taste, smell, and touch. Each of those senses has its own particular sense organ where you, where you find it, uh, where it gets detected, like your eyes are for where your sense of sight is located, and your skin is where your sense of touch is located, just to, as two examples. Uh, so what I'm saying is that in each of your sense organs, you find nervous tissue, and the job of that nervous tissue in the sense organ is to detect the sense stimulus. The stimulus is the thing that's being detected, like for your sense of sight, light is the stimulus. And for your sense of touch, I guess pressure, the touch is the stimulus. And for your sense of smell, the molecules in the air, the scent molecules, are the stimulus. Uh, good, so yeah, so nervous tissue, or I should say the neurons of the nervous tissue, one of their jobs is to detect the sense stimuli in each of your sense organs. The second major job of nervous tissue is rapid signaling between body parts. Um, for instance, if I were lecturing here and not paying attention and I bang my toe on that right there, uh, you know, that might hurt my toe, well, my the sense stimulus, the pain in my toe, that has to send a signal rapidly to my brain so that I know that I hit my toe, and I guess that will help me avoid doing that again. So that involves a very rapid signal all the way up from the tip of my toe to my brain. That's nervous tissue. Uh, nervous tissue sends the signal from, from the various body parts up into your brain. Another example is if I want to pick up this cable right here, 
that involves sending signals from my brain to my arm muscles, right? Because I consciously decide in my brain that I want to pick up that cable, but my muscles are out here, so I have, my brain has to send signals rapidly to my muscles to get them to go out there and, and contract and pick up the cable. So it's just another example of, of, of signaling between body parts, like from your brain to your muscles. That's also the job of, of nervous tissue, rapid signaling between, between body parts. You don't have to know the number that I'm about to tell you, but in case you're curious, signals through your nervous system travel about 200 miles per hour. So they're, they're not instantaneous, but they are, they are pretty darn quick. Okay, uh, so, and the cells of nervous tissue are called neurons. Here's a uh, photograph of a neuron under a microscope. Um, in a way, it sort of looks like a plant. And what I mean by that is, you know, like a tree has a, 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 a like the, the trunk that comes up out of the ground like that. But under the ground, a plant has all these roots that come out of the bulb, like you see there. Uh, so maybe I'll start there. So the, the, the things that look like little roots coming out of the neuron, like here and here and here and here, those are called the dendrites. And the long, skinny part of the neuron, like you see here, uh, is called the axon. Well, those parts of the neuron relate to the functions of nervous tissue that I was just talking about. So one of the functions of nervous tissue is to detect, to detect stimuli, like the neurons in your eyes detect light and the neurons in your skin detect touch. Um, the dendrites are the part of the neuron that detects stimuli. The other function of nervous tissue is sending signals rapidly between body parts. That's what the axon is for. It's long and skinny because it's, it's like a computer cable that sends signals you know, between your computer and the overhead projector or whatever. Uh, so yeah, think of the axon as being like the computer cable part of the neuron. It, it's the part that carries the signals from uh, one body part to another body part. I think it's kind of interesting that you can see the two functions of nervous tissue, the, the sensing stimuli and carrying signals between body parts, you can see those within the structure of each individual neuron. It's got its dendrites to sense the signals, to sense stimuli, and the long skinny axon to, to carry those nervous system signals. Well, we will do a whole lecture on the nervous system uh, in a few weeks. So this is just kind of an introduction to, to nervous tissue. All right, uh, and the there aren't really any subcategories of nervous tissue, so I'm not gonna add anything to the chart back there. Um, the fourth and last of our four major tissue types is called connective tissue. And um, I'll warn you that this one is probably the most uh, complicated of the four tissue types that we're talking about. Um, there are six major types of connective tissue. And so I think I'll go back here and just write them in on the chart. All right, so the six connective tissue types are called loose connective tissue, dense connective tissue, bone, cartilage, adipose, So those are the uh, those are the six subcategories of connective tissue, and it's going to get a little bit more complicated than that. Some of these have sub subcategories to them, and I'll talk about those sub subcategories as we go through the uh, go through these. Well, all right. Uh, so 
perhaps when I just made that list there, it struck you that those tissues are kind of different from each other. What I mean by that is, think about bone. It's like a rock solid tissue, right? But blood is just the opposite. Blood is a liquidy and flowing tissue. And so you might wonder, well, if these connective tissues are so different from each other in their physical properties, why on earth are they lumped together in this, in this same category of, of connective tissue? Well, that's a good question. Uh, as it turns out, connective tissues are not classified as connective tissues because of any physical property in terms of being like a solid or a liquid. They're classified as connective tissues because of what they do. All connective tissues are tissues that surround and support and protect other tissues and, and organs. Um, so let me just give you an example of that. So bone is one of the connective tissues. And let's think about the bones of your skull. Here they are. What are they doing? Why do you have those skull bones? Well, they're surrounding and protecting your brain. Your, the purpose of your skull is to make a safe shell to protect your brain. And so yeah, your, the bone tissue of your skull is there to surround and support, to hold up, and to protect your brain organ. Uh, and so yeah, so, so that, that's, that's, that's a great example of connective tissues. They all do that in one way or another, surround and protect and support other tissues and organs. They're sort of the, the helper tissues of the body is the way I would describe them. Another thing that I want you to know about connective tissue is that the, the cells of connective tissue generally don't touch each other in the tissue. They're kind of spaced apart from each other in the, in the connective tissue. This next slide, I think, here we go. Yeah, this next slide shows a connective tissue under the microscope. The dark blue spots are the cells of the connective tissue. And notice that they are not packed tightly together with each other. They're, they're, there's a lot of space between the cells. Uh, of the connective tissue. And that's kind of different, right? Uh, pretty much all the tissues that we've talked about so far, the cells have been tightly packed together. For epithelial tissue, that was part of the definition, right? It was tightly packed epithelial cells. And when we looked at muscle tissue earlier, you might remember those muscle cells are packed pretty tightly together. And, and likewise, in nervous tissue, the neurons are tight, uh, pretty tightly but with the connective tissue, it's just the opposite. The cells are generally not touching each other. They're spaced apart. All right, um, but we should talk about, well, what's between the cells? You know, it can't be just nothing. It can't be just vacuum between the cells. There's got to be something that fills that spot in space. Well, the stuff that fills the space between connective tissue cells is called the extracellular matrix. And so all this stuff that they're showing between the cells in this photograph is the extracellular matrix of the connective tissue. The extracellular matrix comes from the cells themselves. In other words, the, the connective tissue cells secrete the extracellular matrix to fill, fill the spaces. Um, so I, I want to talk for, before we actually start talking about the six types of connective tissues, I want to talk more about the extracellular cellular matrix. Uh, so you can see in your lecture outlines, it's the material that between the cells of, of the connective tissue is the extracellular matrix, and it's made by the connective tissue cells themselves. But what is it? Well, um, the extracellular matrix has two main ingredients. One of the ingredients of the extracellular matrix is called the ground substance. And the other ingredient of the extracellular matrix are fibrous proteins, or protein fibers, as they're called. And let's start with the fibrous proteins. OK, so fibrous proteins are one of the components of the extracellular matrix. And it's pretty much what it sounds like. Uh, um, fibrous proteins are long, kind of slender proteins. And uh, we talked about them when we talked about proteins, I think, last week as a type of molecule, we learned about the different types of proteins, like there are enzyme proteins and receptor proteins and channel proteins and fibrous proteins. Um, 
Good. So, so when you think of fibrous proteins, think of kind of long, slender proteins that their major job is to bind the cells of connective tissue together. They just sort of are in the, in the extracellular matrix to strengthen and bind together the connective tissue. There are uh, different types of these fibrous proteins. The most abundant is called collagen. And we, we talked about this last week also. If you could somehow grab an individual collagen protein, which you can't because they're too small, you know, they're submicroscopic. But if you could somehow grab an individual collagen protein, it would feel like this. This is a leather strap. And so collagen proteins are strong and tough and leathery, just like this thing is. Um, and so when, when you think of collagen, think of it as, as a, 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 a strong leathery protein. And so the more collagen a connective tissue has, the more tough and leathery that connective tissue is going to be. There's another type of fibrous protein you find in some connective tissues called elastin. Think of elastin as like a rubber band protein. Um, you know, it's not as strong as collagen protein, but it has this interesting ability to be stretched to a longer size and then to snap back to a smaller size. Like that. As elasticity of the tissue. Okay, so just to, to recap, between the cells of a connective tissue is a substance called the extracellular matrix. One ingredient, one component of the extracellular matrix are fibrous proteins like collagen and elastin. The other ingredient of the extracellular matrix is a substance called the ground substance. What is that? Well, that's kind of hard to answer because the ground substance can be a solid substance or it can be a gel, like a jello, or it can be a watery liquid. It really depends on what connective tissue type you're talking about. So it's just, it's just some substance, solid, gel, or liquid uh, that you find in the extracellular matrix of, of, of connective tissues. Um, generally, the ground substance takes up most of the extracellular matrix. It's a little hard to see here, but if you think of this white material as the ground substance, you can see that most of the, uh, of the extracellular matrix is the ground substance, and a relatively small part of the extracellular matrix are the fibrous proteins. There are some exceptions to that. In some connective tissues, what we'll see is most of the extracellular matrix is the proteins and relatively little of it is the ground substance. But in general, the ground substance makes up most of the matrix. All right, and one last thing about the extracellular matrix. The properties of the extracellular matrix, its physical properties, generally set the physical properties of the connective tissue. Like if a connective tissue has a rock solid ground substance, in its extracellular matrix, that connective tissue is going to be rock solid. And if a connective tissue has a whole bunch of collagen fibers in its extracellular matrix, then that connective tissue is going to be a tough, leathery connective tissue. OK, um, so all that being introduction to the connective tissues, now let's start talking about the six subcategories of connective tissues. Do I have them listed? Uh, there. OK, I guess I don't have them listed here, but they're uh, listed in your uh, lecture outlines and in the whiteboard back there. OK, so the first of our six connective tissue types is called loose connective tissue. Think of it as jelly. Uh, if I had to describe loose connective tissue in one, one word, I would say jelly. Um, or maybe jello, you know, it's kind of sort of a, a soft and flexible semi-solid jelly-like connective tissue. Um, your body kind of uses it as a general packing foam, um, like a protective jelly for various tissues and or to surround various tissues and organs. Uh, let's see. Let me give you an example. This uh, sort of pink-looking stuff out here is loose connective tissue. And it's protecting this capillary. Capillaries are small blood vessels. 
which are kind of a delicate little organ. And so to help protect it, your body surrounds the capillaries with this loose connective tissue here. So imagine that this is like a jelly-like substance that's surrounding and protecting that capillary. And here's another example. It's a little hard to see, but this is the cross-section of, of one of your intestines. Intestines are one of the digestive organs. So you can see this hollow space in the middle where the food goes through. Oh, let me give you a quick review question. So since this is a hollow organ, what sort of tissue has to be the innermost lining? All hollow organs. Epithelia, right. So that's got to be epithelial tissue right there. And let me give you a, another review question. Since it's a hollow organ, what sort of muscle tissue does it have to have in its wall? Smooth muscle tissue. Very good. You guys got it. Good. Uh, but what I'm actually talking about now is the loose connective tissue. Uh, so if you think about it, your intestines have to be, have some flexibility to them because sometimes food is going through there and sometimes there's no food inside there. Um, so your body puts a layer of loose connective tissue just underneath the epithelial layer. And so that allows the epithelial layer to be a little bit flexible and able, able to move around a little bit to, to, to flex and bend to accommodate the big pieces of chicken or pizza or whatever after you've eaten a meal. Anyway, so yeah, think of loose connective tissue as, as a jelly-like or jello-like connective tissue uh, that allows, it surrounds and protects various organs and tissues and allows them to flex and bend without being damaged. Well, let's now see the loose connective tissue at a, more of a microscopic close-up. This is what it looks like. The dark spots are the actual cells of the loose connective tissue. And just as, just as promised, you can see they're not really touching each other. They're spaced apart from each other. The cells of loose connective tissue are called fibroblast cells. Fibroblast cells. And the extracellular matrix is composed of a jelly-like ground substance. It's actually sort of the white area that they're showing here is the, uh, the jelly-like ground substance. And that's why loose connective tissues have a jelly-like property to them is because of all that jelly-like ground substance that they have in their matrix. But crisscrossing through the extracellular matrix are some fibrous proteins. You find collagen proteins and elastin proteins in the extracellular matrix. The uh, collagen proteins are the ones that they're showing in red in this picture, and the elastin proteins are the ones that they're showing in black. Uh, there we go. So the matrix, the extracellular matrix is, has some collagen and elastin proteins, but it has lots of open spaces that have that jelly-like brown substance. Uh, loose connective tissue, think of the jelly-like tissue. Um, so moving onward, the next of our six connective tissue types is called dense connective tissue. Um, as you might guess from the name, it's the dense connective tissue is thicker and stronger than loose connective tissue, a strong leathery connective tissue. Oops, is the way to think of dense connective tissue. Yeah, so if I had to uh, describe it in one word, I would say leather. It's a leather-like connective tissue. The cells of dense connective tissue are called fibroblasts, which is the same cell type that we had for the loose connective tissue, right? Uh, so these purple-looking things here are the fibroblast cells. So there's a fibroblast, and there's a fibroblast. Fibroblast, fibroblast, fibroblast. Um, so the, the cells are the same as loose connective tissue. It's the extracellular matrix that's very different. In dense connective tissue, the extracellular matrix is almost entirely collagen protein, that tough, leathery protein. So since the extracellular matrix is pretty much 100% collagen protein, and collagen proteins are strong and tough and leathery, you get a very strong and tough and leathery connective tissue. 
connective tissue, which you can think of as almost like rope-like, le like leather rope uh, style connective tissue. All right, so uh, the dense connective tissue provides strong connections between organs and tissues that require a strong non-tearing uh, reinforcement. So let me give you some examples of those. Um, this is a, supposed to be the knee joint. And I guess I should say, well, what is a joint? Joints are just where one bone meets another bone. Like in your knee joint, it's composed up on top of a bone called your, your, um, your femur bone, your thigh bone. And at the bottom of the knee joint is a bone um, called the tibia. And there's actually another bone not being shown called the patella. Uh, but I'm not really lecturing on the knee joint. My point is that a joint is just wherever one bone meets another bone. Well, when you use those joints, like I'm bending my knee joints right now, uh, the, bones ha the bones would be grinding against each other unless there was a protective, uh, 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 sorry, uh, sorry, I got off on, tr on track. Um, so th this, is, this is a joint, but for a second, don't worry about the grinding. I'm gonna come back to that later when I talk about cartilage. What I meant to say in this part of the lecture was to keep those bones properly aligned with each other on the outside of a joint is a structure called a ligament. This white fibrous looking thing you see here is a ligament. And ligaments are as an example of a structure in the body that's made of dense connective tissue. Ligaments connect one bone to another bone in a joint and they are made out of dense connective tissue because they have to be very strong and tough and not tearing. You know, if they did tear, then well, you would easily rip your ligaments every time you put any weight on your, on, on your joints. Um, tendons are much the same thing as ligaments, but tendons join muscle to bone instead of bone to bone. These gray structures here are the, are the tendons. They are made of pretty much 100% dense connective tissue, uh, again, because they have to be very strong and not rip when you're using your muscles to move your skeleton. And there are other structures in the body other than tendons and ligaments, which are also dense connective tissue. Um, but tendons and ligaments are, are good examples of dense connective tissue. Right, so whenever you think of dense connective tissue, think of leather. All right, uh, well then, uh, oh, I was gonna mention that, I remember reading somewhere that um, American Indians used the tendons and ligaments from buffalo and other animals that they hunted, they use those to make their bow and arrow strings from. And to me, that, that underscored what tough tissues they are, because when you know, pull back your bow and arrow, that, there's a lot of tension on that string, and you need to make it out of something that's not gonna break. That's why they used animal tendons and ligaments for that. All right, moving onward, the next of our six connective tissue types is bone. Uh, so before we get into the, the previous one, yeah, uh, one second. Uh, this one? Oh, that one. Oh, sorry, okay. Now, you know you can download those from the, from the website, right? Okay, okay, cool. Um, all right, so moving here. So the next of our six connective tissue types is bone connective tissue. Um, this bone tissue is found in your bones. I guess that sounds obvious when I say it, right? Uh, your bones are, are actually considered organs, uh, like your arm bone is an organ, and your radius and ulna, which are the bones in your forearm or organs. Each of your bones is an organ, but I'm saying bone tissue is the major tissue of, of, of each of your bone organs. Um, so I said a rock-like connective tissue that to protect and anchor organs. Um, so I, I guess I already mentioned an example of that. Let's say the skull is an example. The purpose of your skull is to surround and protect and support your brain, to hold your brain in place and keep it safe. And your ribs are another good example. 
their job, or at least one of their jobs, is to surround and protect and anchor your heart and your lungs. Those are inside your, your rib cage. Yeah, so think of uh, bone tissue as well being part of bone organs, and your bone organs are there to protect and surround and anchor other organs uh, of your body. All right, if I had to describe bone tissue in just a single word, I would say rock, or perhaps rock-like. It's the, it's the most rock-like of, uh, uh, of, your, of your connective tissues. Let's zoom in on it, like looking at it through a microscope. Here's what uh, bone tissue looks like under the microscope. The dark spots are the bone cells, and those are called osteocytes. Um, osteo means bone, and site means cell, so it, the term literally means bone cells. Right, so here's an osteocyte. Here's an osteocyte, 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 osteocyte. And just as you, as you know, that the, the cells of connective tissues don't generally touch each other. You can see that the uh, bone cells are, are not really touching each other. And so the stuff between them, of course, is the extracellular matrix of the bone tissue. Um, most of that extracellular matrix is a calcium phosphate ground substance. Um, Calcium phosphate is, is a rock-like substance. It's a solid substance made out of calcium and phosphate, as you, as you, can, as you can tell from the name. The, uh, because of the fact that the, your bone extracellular matrix has calcium as one of its ingredients, that's why they always tell us to get a lot of calcium in our diet for strong bones. Your, your, your bone extracellular matrix needs calcium, and so so that's why you need calcium uh, in your diet for proper bone strength. The, although the calcium phosphate is strong and rock-like, it would be a little bit too, uh, nevertheless, it needs to be strengthened. And so that's where the collagen comes in. Uh, with a little imagination, you can see little lines crisscrossing through the white calcium phosphate, and you can think of those as collagen proteins. Uh, Crisscrossing through the calcium phosphate are collagen proteins to reinforce the calcium phosphate, to make it stronger. And I, I, I know I keep showing this next slide, but I think it's, it's a good, it's instructive. Uh, you can make an analogy with the bone tissue. The concrete is like the calcium phosphate and the rebar steels are like the collagen fibers. You know, when they build something out of concrete, the concrete is rock-like, but they embed these rebar steels to strengthen the concrete. So in your bone tissue, it's mostly calcium phosphate, which is rock-like, but they, it's in, uh, collagen fibers are embedded within it to strengthen it. All right, um, well, so not this week, but next week in lab, we're going to be doing a laboratory on um, the bones. And you'll look at the bone tissue under the microscope in that lab. And just as a preview of what you're going to see, the, the bone tissue is laid down in circular patterns. You know, look at this. There's an osteocyte, and there's an osteocyte, and an osteocyte, and there's that extracellular matrix, you know, the calcium phosphate with the collagen fibers between the bone cells, but you can see it's laid out in kind of a circular pattern. And those are called osteons. So there's one osteon of the bone tissue, and here's another osteon of the bone tissue. Uh, under the microscope, the bone, what you'll see is that each, uh, the bone tissue is made of hundreds of those osteon structures. Uh, and I didn't put osteons in the notes because they're not really part of this lecture. I was just trying to give you a preview of what you'll see when we do the skeletal system in a, few, in a couple weeks. All right, the next of our connective tissues is called cartilage. And if I had to describe it in one word, I would say rubber. It's the body's rubbery connective tissue. Just as a good example is your ear. I mean, your ear does have skin on the outside, but underneath that is cartilage. And it is kind of rubbery, right? It's, it's flexible and bendable and just like, just like rubber is. Yeah, so think of cartilage as your body's rubber tissue. At a uh, cellular level, it looks like this. The uh, 
dark spots you see here are the chondrocytes. The, the chondrocytes are the, uh, the, the, the cells of cartilage tissue. The extracellular matrix between the cartilage cells is mostly a rubbery ground substance called chondrin. That's what makes cartilage rubbery is the chondrin ground substance. But crisscrossing through the chondrin are some collagen fibers to reinforce it and, and, and strengthen the, uh, the, the extracellular matrix. All right, well, there are three subcategories of cartilage, and I better jot those down on the whiteboard. I'm definitely getting in my uh, 10,000 steps in this lecture. Okay, the three types of cartilage are called hyaline cartilage, elastic cartilage, and fibrocartilage. Wow, so those are the three categories of cartilage. And a cartilage is one of the six types of connective tissue, and connective tissue is one of the four major types of tissue in the body. A lot of like nesting of categories within, within larger categories, right? Okay, let's do a quick tour of these three cartilage types. Uh, the hyaline cartilage, it's found at the tips of your bones and joints. So yeah, a joint is wherever one bone meets another bone, like this is the knee joint. When you use that joint, the bones would just be grinding against each other unless they had a protective covering. Or what I'm trying to say is your bones would be damaged when you use the joint because your bones would just be grinding against each other. So to protect the bones in a joint, your body covers the tips of bones with hyaline cartilage. So think of that as like a strong, rubbery layer to protect the tips of the bones uh, in, in the joint. Hyaline cartilage is joint cartilage. The uh, next of the three cartilage types is called elastic cartilage. It's the softest and most flexible of the three cartilage types. Just to give one example of where you find it is the ear. You know, your ears are very soft and flexible. Another example of elastic cartilage is in your throat. There are some cartilage rings here in your throat to keep your windpipe nice and open. And if you think about it, those have to be very soft and flexible because you can move your head around all the way there, there, up or down. And so your body needs to make those out of something that's going to be flexible. That's why it makes those those rings in your, in your windpipe out of, out of elastic cartilage. The uh, last of the three cartilage types is called fibrocartilage, the toughest and most leathery cartilage type. Um, so remember, let me get back up here to the, to the extracellular matrix. Uh, so uh, the extracellular matrix of cartilage, of all types of cartilage, is mostly that rubbery ground substance, the chondrin. But remember that there are some collagen fibers that crisscross through the chondrin. Well, fibrocartilage has more of those collagen fibers than the other types of cartilage. Oops. Right? And so since the fibrocartilage has more collagen in it, and collagen is tough and leathery protein, that means the fibrocartilage is going to be tough and leathery. It, it's still a type of cartilage. So it's still rubbery, but it's, it's kind of a tough, leathery rubber, so to speak. Um, your body uses the fibrocartilage to make cushioning discs in some of the joints. If it's a joint that carries a lot of your body weight, like your knees or, or your spine, your body wants to put some cushioning discs between the bones, and your body makes those cushioning discs between uh, 
some of the bones out of fibrocartilage. You might have heard of a person slipping a disc. Like you, you might have heard some people, they try to pick up something that's too heavy and like, oh, I slipped a disc in my back. Well, that's what they're talking about. Those fibrocartilage discs in their back got damaged because they put too much weight uh, on them. 